Hello dear guests and welcome to a special winter themed journaling video. As some of you already know, I am a cultural anthropologist and folklore is definitely my favorite topic, so today I have prepared a special story for you, something that I am making a spread about in my journal right now. This something is something seasonal and kind of dark and theatrical, right in tune with the aesthetic of my little channel and my personal aesthetic. You know, Teatrum Tenebrarum, which is the name of my channel, is Latin for dark theater, which is a term that encapsulates this vibe for me. My whole life I've been infatuated with the weird, the mysterious, slightly monstrous and poetic. That led me onto the path of researching folklore and eventually I enrolled into my university where I studied cultural anthropology and art history. So, uh, yeah, uh, today's topic. Now, let me state this first. Now, obviously, this is a voiceover. You can see me making a sort of commonplace entry about Krampus in my journal. And the information I am documenting here is basically some of the bits of the stuff I am talking about in the video, as well as some extra information I'd like to have documented. If there's anything in particular that you see here that interests you, feel free to leave me a comment so I can try and elaborate it further. I really, really love talking about the things that I'm into, both as a cultural anthropologist and an art historian and uh, like a regular person. So if you like learning about the weird, the historical, the folkloric and um, the mysterious stuff, consider joining me on this little lovely and weird journey. <laughs> so yeah, on to the Krampus. Uh, now, <clears throat> if you're European, you are probably familiar with the day of Saint Nicholas, which is celebrated on December the 6th. Now, however, what most people aren't familiar with is that the day before, or the eve of Saint Nicholas's feast day, is sometimes also called the Krampusnacht, which is a German word meaning the night of Krampus. Krampus is thought to be a sort of devil or beast-like figure, one that is usually depicted with fur, horns and hooves, which is a typical devil type of iconography that we can actually trace back uh, all the way to the medieval era and medieval art. Now, in the most famous traditional telling, Krampus actually accompanies Saint Nicholas as he hands out presents to the well-behaved children at the end of the year, whereas Krampus is the one who punishes those children who were not acting very nice throughout the year. Now, even though the Krampus is tied to the Catholic tradition in this way, it is very likely that the figure of Krampus that we know of today is actually a remnant of something much older that has in its own way assimilated into the newer Catholic celebration of the day of Saint Nick. The only way we can reach out to this something much older in order to try to gain a better understanding of it is to locate the region where it appears to be originating from. In the case of the Krampus, the tradition associated with this folkloric figure is usually tied to the region of the Alps, the most prominent snowy European mountain range, 
More specifically, the tales of the Krampus come from the deep forests of alpine and subalpine regions of the German Bavaria, Upper Austria and Tyrol. Now, some areas in these regions that have preserved the Krampus tradition in some way are all geographically kind of isolated. Historically, they depended on hunting and forestry and the skills that people honed in these areas include working with animal hide, wood carving and even taxidermy. Now, that is valuable and interesting information as these traditions associated with the Krampus always involve processions and plays that include the Krampus character who is played by a person or persons, depending on the tradition, clad in a fur costume, often with a wooden mask and prominent horns, dragging chains and bells and creating this weird yet stunning show wherever they go. These Grampus disguises have changed a lot through history, as is always the case with cultural phenomena. Nowadays they are mostly influenced by the modern devil sort of imagery of popular culture, and the traditional practices themselves have changed as well and they are appearing in their modern versions even uh, as so far as in the United States. Now I would like to tell you a bit about two of these Krampus traditions which are the most well-known ones so you can get an idea of the context in which this being appears. The first and most well-known one is the visit of Saint Nicholas. These events take place on December the 5th, which is the eve of Saint Nick's Day, or on the day of Saint Nicholas itself. To most Europeans, Krampus is known as Saint Nicholas's scary, devilish companion who punishes naughty children. This fantastic duo who visits town squares, Christmas markets, homes and schools where they test the children together. If the children behaved properly throughout the year, Saint Nicholas gives them gifts, usually in the forms of candy. However, if they did not behave, they are to be punished by the Krampus in such a way that they would receive just a single boring branch, at best, instead of candy, and at worst they would get whipped and even abducted in a large basket that Krampus is thought to sometimes wear on his back. What's even more frightening is that sometimes Saint Nicholas would be accompanied by more than one Krampus, so you'd have an entire troop of hairy winter demons coming over for coffee. When Saint Nick and Krampus visit the house, the tradition says that children ought to show off their skills to them, usually in the form of a performance of sorts. That could be singing a song in front of the guests, reciting a poem or playing an instrument. The children were usually rehearsing this performance for weeks, that is how important it was. If the performance was delivered well, Saint Nick would reward the children with a variety of treats such as chocolates, apples, nuts and gingerbread cookies. Sometimes the troupe would make the cookies themselves, which is honestly such a cool thought. This sort of Krampus custom where Saint Nicholas and Krampus or Krampuses go from house to house is still adhered to in places where the Krampus tradition is the strongest, such as the Austrian town of Bad Gastein. The second tradition associated with the Krampus is the so-called Krampus Run. Krampus runs are probably the most well-known and the most performed contemporary Krampus tradition that is essentially a procession 
in which a large group of Krampuses performs a sort of ceremonial walk or a run. Sometimes they play instruments and mostly they cause mischief, usually on town squares. Now, processions are one of my favorite folkloric phenomena. They are so layered, so intense and fun, and due to them being so ancient, it's often impossible to uncover all of their secrets. I'll point you to the fact that the most prominent aspect of the Krampus folklore is masking, and if we look at one of the names for masks worn in Krampus traditions and some carnival masks in general, in fact, which is Larven, we get a bit more close to the mystery of Krampus. You see, Larva is a Latin word which can be translated as a mask, but also as a ghost. Language has, we can see, in a way, uh, brought us at the right doorstep, as it does make sense to look at the Krampus and the remnants of the tradition it was a part of as ways of either embodying ghosts or spirit-like beings through masking or interacting with them. The traditions including the Krampus figure are definitely not the only such traditions that involve masks, as there are a lot of them throughout Europe and they are so varied. It is important to note that all of these traditions take place during winter time, starting from the beginning of December and lasting sometimes even up to March the following year. They always include masks and full costumes, usually with a therianthropic element. And this sort of wild creativity expressed in combining human and animal elements in costumes actually often goes way above any human or animal referent so that they actually end up really evoking mythical beasts or spirits. Most folklorists agree that these masked processions can be interpreted as a way in which the villagers confront the spirits of winter time and ward them away in order to let spring commence. Now, in the past, winters were known to be quite long and rather unforgiving in these areas, and there was this need for showing the winter spirits the way out, to say it simply. Now, there is also another masked folkloric spirit in these alpine regions that has its own tradition and that coexists with the Krampus ones. These spirits are called Perchten. Yes, I am butchering it because I am not German. And they got their name from their leader, who is a specific folk figure called Frau Perchta, Frau being German for a lady. Sometimes she is also called Berchta. Now, she, along with her spirits, usually appears on January the 6th, aka the date of the Catholic Epiphany, a date which was formerly even called Perch Day in Austrian Bavaria. Now, the folkloric traditions related to these spirits seem quite similar to the Krampus ones, especially in modern renderings of these traditions. There are masked processions of scary beast-like creatures, scaring possible victims, but they are thought to be a completely different tradition than the Krampus one. Their leader, Perta, is an enigmatic folkloric being. She is considered to be a goddess, most notably a goddess of weaving and spinning, and she had a tendency to oversee how humans would be approaching those household duties. 
Folklore tells us if she were to see that a household had some unspun flax by the 6th of January, she would burn the hands of the spinner at best, while at worst she would slit open and gut her victims. Over time she would start to oversee other household activities and would scare people into polishing their homes clean by epiphany. Berta and her spirits required specific food as offerings, namely those of milk porridge, sometimes with some honey on top, eggs, fried dumplings, amongst others. This food would be left on a special table just for them, or the costumed figures would be given the food upon visiting a household, just like the Krampuses, in exchange for good luck in the following year. Now, some of you who are well acquainted with some pop culture tropes will likely find it interesting that Perta is sometimes considered to be a leader of the wild hunt, her entourage obviously being the other hunters, her spirits, all of them those winter spirits closely related to the dead and the other world. The famous folklorist Jakob Grimm is the one responsible for that particular connection, along with many other valuable connections he has made concerning Perta, such as, for example, linking her to the goddess figures such as Hecate and understanding the dual aspect of this goddess and these goddesses. All that makes them beautiful, but also very frightening. And uh, this is where we'll conclude our pondering of winter spirits. Uh, the Krampus and the Perchten are expressions of what winter time is, or rather what it used to be in older times. They are intricately connected to the areas where they appear and in a way, they give meaning to the experience of life there. But also, they are an expression of unbridled creativity that we humans innately have. The creativity which we confront our lives and the world around us. The creativity that is, in its essence, spiritual and it is always present and available to us even though we somehow keep forgetting that anyway if you've made it this far in the video thank you for being here and for listening to me i hope you got something out of this video and if you have any specific questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and I'll see if I can try and answer them. And yeah, I will see you soon. Take care.